Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar. My name is Mtokozi Singosi. Some people call me MT for short. So I'm a food scientist by profession and also a bit of, uh, done a bit of agriculture. And uh, now I am mainly focusing on implementing the systems auditing as well as uh, training uh, for uh, the food safety certification schemes, uh, as well as uh, accredited courses. So that is basically what we are currently doing. I come from a company called ASC Consultants. Uh, it's primarily based in Port Elizabeth, but we have got branches throughout the country that will be in Cape Town, Durban, as well as Johannesburg. So in terms of this webinar, what we'll be doing, we'll be looking at the version uh, 6 FSSC 22000 version 6 changes and trying to make sense of what those changes are. In terms of our schedule for the day, we are going to do the introduction and then the part one, we are going to do scheme overview. And then part two, we are going to look at uh, the additional requirements where most of the changes have been introduced. So there are four reasons why the FSSC 22000 was upgraded. Uh, so the first one was that, if you remember, we had the ISO 22003 uh, of 2013. They have revised it to ISO 22003 uh, part um, one of 2022. So the revision of that standard resulted in some of the interpretation of the requirements of ISO 22000 to be revised. So that was the first thing. Then the second reason was that uh, as part of the most um, of all the GFSI recognized scheme, they have strengthened the requirements to support organizations in their contribution to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That's why you'll see something like food waste, food loss as part of the additional requirements. It's not necessarily linked to the scheme, but mainly to the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals, although it's going to be audited uh, as part and parcels a parcel of your of the FSSC 22000 audits. Then a third reason is to aligning the FSSC 22000 with the new GFSI um, requirements. If you have in, been seen uh, or seen in the news, some of the schemes were initially suspended from being GFSI recognized merely because they had not aligned their requirements to be in line with the GFSI. So that's one of the uh, reasons why they've got to, they had to up, uh, upgrade and uh, move to version six. And then another fourth, uh, uh, another reason which will be the fourth, it is the editorial changes and amendments as part of continuous improvement. So you'd see that in some of the clauses, there hasn't been any major changes. It has merely been uh, grammatical uh, fixes um, and also making sure that the standard or the scheme requirements read flawlessly. So those are the main, four main reasons for the updated version of the FSSC 22000 scheme. Okay, so now let's move to the overview of the changes, what are the major changes, what has been introduced. So the new things that have been introduced is the introduction of category that relates to the handling of plants. We never had that on FSSC 22000 and also introduction of SEP category uh, CD relating to animal conversion. So that has been introduced and also the scheme has introduced new requirements on quality control, food loss and waste and equipment management. Some of the other scheme, for example, the PRCGS already introduced uh, these requirements in, their, in the version and now FSSC has also introduced it in the version 6. There is also additional requirements for food packaging. For example, the artwork design approval procedure, something that we never had on the FSSC. And QR code has been added to the FSSC 22000 certificates for improved traceability and also authenticity of the certificates. And there are additional categories that have also been introduced, for example, also the brokering and uh, trading category. We know that in the other scheme, if you're a broker or 
or an agent, you could get certified. But now in the FSC 22,000, you also have that opportunity to gain certification if you are an agent and broker. So let's look at what has been modified. So a modification of category F, which is now trading, retail, and um, wholesale. So that has been um, also uh, modified uh, to align to also other schemes internationally. And then category D has been reverted to read processing of feed and animal food. Then another uh, modification is the integration of the requirements on food safety and quality culture. So it's been very now with the version six is very explicit in terms of what is it that is required of sites to ensure that they comply with food safety and quality culture requirements. They have strengthened additional requirements in part two of the scheme, including but not limited to allergen management and environmental monitoring. So those were indeed part of the uh, scheme, but now they have more or less uh, elaborated what is it that the site needs to do in order to fully comply with the requirement. And then there are changes to clarification on requirement for the certification uh, process. What is it that certification certification uh, bodies uh, would need to uh, follow in order to be able to certify uh, on the FSC 22,000 scheme. What has been removed? So we have seen what has been, what is new, what has been modified, but what has been removed on the scheme? Farming of animals, which was previously category A, has been removed. The FSC 22,000 quality has been removed from the scheme. So those of you who have been certified on FSC 22,000 quality, FSC will no longer offer such, offer such uh, certification. Instead, you'll have to revert back to uh, ISO 9001, uh, 2015 certification for your quality management system. So FSSC has removed that completely. Instead, they've introduced something that they call FSSC 24,000, which is uh, ethical or social audits. Those of you who are in South Africa would be familiar with CESA audits. So it's something that is similar. Those of you who have worked in the farming industry would know that there is something that we call grab speed that, that would be ethical audits or even smeter audits. So it's something similar to that. So they are introducing that. And the launch uh, at our auditors conference was announced to be in September uh, of um, September. Yes, September of this year, where they'll uh, explain exactly how this will uh, be working or how this will be audited. And then ISO 22003 of 2013 has been replaced by ISO 22003 of 2022. That is the requirements for uh, bodies providing audit and certification of food safety management system. Obviously, the moment uh, that has been changed, it has implications on the FSSC 22000 scheme since certification bodies get guidance from the scheme or from that standard in terms of how they should be auditing sites uh, for food uh, safety management system relating specifically uh, to ISO 22000. So now let's look at part one as per our agenda. Uh, we are looking at the scope. What are food chain subcategories that uh, you will be audited against as organization? So the first one, which is category B, uh, it has been introduced in FSSC. It relates to the handling of plants. So if you go to the FSSC 22,000 scheme documents, they'll elaborate there that it refers to the handling of plants that did not transform the product from the original whole form. For example, that will be fruit and vegetable pack houses where only minimal processing that could be uh, post-harvest treatment or you are just merely washing the fruit and then packing it. So you'll fall under category B. Then category C, it has remained um, largely as it was, uh, except that they've introduced new categories, C0, um, that relates to the conversion of animal carcass, including processes such as layerage, slaughter, evisceration, bark chilling, and freezing, as well as bark storage. So you'll fall under C0 if you are being or if your facility does such processes. 
Then C1 relates to the processing of perishable uh, animal products, processing and packaging of animal products, including fish, seafood, meat, poultry, eggs, dairy, requiring chilled or frozen temperature control, and processing of pet uh, food from animal products uh, only. So that is our C1. So you'll fall under that category. C2, the new change there is plant-based meat and dairy substitutes and the processing of pet food from plant products only. So that has been an addition to C2. So it has largely remained as it was, except that they've uh, elaborated and clarified what uh, organization will fall under this category. And then C3, processing of perishable animal and plant products that will be mixed products. So it's neither animal or plant, but it's mixed. You will find that an organization does um, multiple things. So it's not necessarily that they are animal product focused or plant product focused. So in terms of this uh, category, it caters for such uh, organization. So that could also be pet food from mixed, uh, 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 either animal or plant-based uh, products and also offsite catering uh, kitchens and products of industrial kitchens that are not offered for immediate consumption. No change really on C4, the, except that they have and added ambient stable pet food. So that is the major change there. And another interesting change that I would like us to look at is F2, where they are looking at brokering, trading, or e-commerce. So if you fall under that category where you buy and sell product on uh, your own account without physical handling, as an agent and broker, you'd fall under this category. Interestingly, on F1, they've also recognized that the world is evolving. So they've added e-commerce. So if if you have got any um, activities, uh, e-commerce activities that will fall, that will be the category that will fall under, and then they have removed G one and G two. Let's look at another interesting change that is category D, uh, processing and of feed and animal food. So they have designated that category just for that, and they have removed D two as well as D three. So if you go to the scheme documents, you'll then see the overall uh, picture in terms of what category is it that your organization fall under. Okay, so now let's look at part two. In terms of part two, this is the most important change. And, you know, if you look at those changes, they seem very minimal in terms of the number of pages that you, as you peruse through the additional requirements. But the implications for the uh, food uh, organizations, organizations that are certified are quite, uh, you know, dire. Because if you have not properly implemented those things, some of them that are written uh, as a one sentence, but that means a lot. There are so many things that you'll need to do as an organization in order to comply. As we go through these additional requirements, we are not going to go through those that hasn't um, had any changes. So we are only going to go through those where there are new changes that have been introduced. So the first one, that we'll look at is our uh, kit clause uh, 2.51 that looks at management of services and purchase materials. Remember that we have already looked at the categories. So what you need to do is to just check uh, in terms of if I say refer to this category, if it's applicable to that organization, depending on the category that you fall under or not. So for food chain categories C0, C1, C3, and C4, the organization shall have a policy for procuring animal, uh, animals, fish, and seafood. So if your organization fall under those categories, you must ensure that you introduce a policy that uh, looks at how do you procure animals, fish, and seafood. And then for food chain category one, the organization shall establish um, a criteria related to using recycled packaging as a raw material material input into producing finished packaging material and ensuring that relevant legal and customer requirements are met. So this could include the source of recycled packaging. Where is it coming from? What type of packaging is it? And also uh, 
what are the limits that you are using to produce, uh, assuming that maybe you use it in uh, making a, a certain product, but you are using a certain portion or a specific percentage of recycled packaging. You need to have a policy that clarifies how this process goes about. Are there any limits in terms of percentage forms that you introduce into this new product? What is um, the quality uh, measure or specification of that recycled packaging that you are going to follow in order to ensure that it has no, it doesn't have any elements that could end up causing harm or possibly affecting your, your products, the one that you are creating as a packaging in, uh, manufacturing institution, because we have to look at things like chemical migration, for example, the previous use of the product, where is it coming from, and so on and so forth. And if you are exporting to the EU, there are specific regulations there where they have um, required authorities to do an inspection of any facility that use recycled packaging. So remember to use also or to look at where is your product going to? What, what is the intended destination to ensure that you take the requirements of that region or that country into account? Then in product labeling, they have basically said that if you are making any claims that uh, about your product, uh, either it is plant-based, it's gluten-free, it is uh, organic uh, or halal or kosher, whatever claim that you make, you must ensure that you have got a validation that you have done uh, on that claim and have verification systems that you do in support of the claim. And that should include also traceability, mass balance to ensure that the product integrity is maintained. So make sure that any claim that you make, you can can validate it and there is a verification system that you follow. Remember the difference when you validate is an initial proof that this thing indeed is what I'm claiming. As you verify, you are checking against that claim whether I'm still complying with what I did in the validation study. So we should never confuse the two. Then for those that belong to category, food chain category one, uh, you must have a procedure for the artwork management and print approval which must include the following. So remember, in terms of the standard, this is a shell. These are minimum requirements that you must include if you fall under food chain category one. Artwork standard uh, or master sample, each uh, print and run against the agreed standard or master sample must be included as part of the procedure. So if you fall under this category, category I, and then there must also be a process to manage artwork. You know, how do you go about it? Who gives approval, uh, final approval? What are the quality checks that you follow to ensure that that artwork is indeed what is supposed to go to production? Print specifications, what are the print specifications? Normally in terms of this, we have got an agreement uh, as perhaps a, as a company that uh, manufactures packaging with our printers that these are our print specifications and on an annual basis depending on the customer base will then uh, change it you know but in communication with the company that does our that, that does the printing as possibly a food uh, packaging manufacturing company but you must have a procedure for that how is that managed obsolete artwork and printing materials how do you manage it and ensure that it never get it never gets reused uh, for any other reason in the future and it doesn't land on wrong hands how to detect and identify printing errors what is the process that you follow how to ensure effective segregation of different print variants so if you are printing for company a and company b how to ensure that you maintain the chain of custody and there is no way that there can be a mix up as you print you must also have a process to account for any unused printed product. How do you manage uh, such products? Do you decommission? Uh, do you destroy them? Do you burn them in an incinerator? Do you, um, you know, do a form of decommissioning of uh, the the printing, uh, you know, machine that you use? What is the process that you follow uh, in terms of that? Then food defense, we are all familiar with food defense. It's applicable to all food, uh, food chain categories. And in terms of this requirement as an organization, you are expected to conduct and document the food defense threat assessment 
based on a defined methodology. So what does it mean? You may decide to follow a certain diet methodology, but you must also define how are you doing your own threat assessment because the threat assessment that is done by company A could be uh, different to a threat assessment that is done by company B. And you must also evaluate potential threats linked to the processes and products within the organization scope. So basically here, you shouldn't make a food defense threat assessment that is generic. Some of the sites simply have got a checklist, but in this case, they want it to be linked to the process. Remember that as an organization, when you do a hair sub study, you have got a process flow that you follow in manufacturing the product. So you could consider doing something similar to that and also look at the products that you have. That is a part of the scope of the organization how to ensure that you protect them against uh, intentional contamination by people that are motivated by malice or any hatred or um, ideology of any sort. The organization shall also have a documented food defense plan based on the threat assessment, specifying the mitigation measures and verification procedures. So based on the threat assessment is an addition there. So the food defense plan must link to the threat assessment that you as an organization have formulated. So if you have got this threat assessment, your procedures must be relevant to that. It shouldn't be a generic procedure that doesn't take into account the plan that you as an organization have drawn up. The plan must be implemented and for food chain category F2, the organization shall ensure that its suppliers have a food defense plan. Whichever way that you follow, as long as you can prove to the auditor when I come to your site and audit you, you can prove that indeed, this is how I have ensured. Either you could say that because the FSOC 22000 certified, surely one of the requirements would be that they've got a food defense plan that is in place. So whichever way that you could use to support your claim is valid as long as it is justifiable. What you would not possibly be accepted is if you are sourcing a product from an organization that doesn't have any GFSI recognition, and then you say that based on what they've told you, they've got a food defense plan. In that case, you are then required to either get um, confirmation of, of, uh, of some sort to prove that that organization has a food defense plan or have that food defense plan in place. You know, you, you ask them to send it to you and you file it uh, in your filing system. So whichever way that you can prove would be valid as long as, of course, it is logical and there is some form of proof that you have. Now let's look at food fraud. Remember food fraud, intentional in, uh, uh, contamination of food motivated by economic gain. So what is it that they want here? Again, it's similar to food defense. They want you to have uh, a documented food, uh, food fraud vulnerability assessment based on a defined methodology. How do you how, how did you do this vulnerability assessment? What factors did you consider? Did you use the GFSI guidance document in terms of food fraud? Did you use FSSC 22000 guidance document in terms of food fraud? What is it that you use to justify the assessment that you have done as an organization? The assessment shall cover the processes. Again, the processes of the organization, it shouldn't be generic. It should cover the processes of the organization and the products within this uh, organization scope. Fortunately here, most sites you know, that I've audited in the um, last uh, six years where food fraud became a big issue, they've done it so nicely by looking at the ingredients in their own organization and scrutinizing their vulnerability to food fraud, so, which is very good. So I don't think here we are going to have a lot of issues as we start the audits uh, next year. The plan must be implemented and for food chain category F2, the organization shall ensure that its suppliers have a food fraud mitigation plan. Again, it's your responsibility as a company to ensure that um, your uh, suppliers uh, have a food fraud mitigation plan that they've put in place. Okay. Local use. No different, not, nothing here, nothing major, except that the certified organization is not allowed to use the FSCC 22000 logo, any statement or make reference to its certified status on certificates of analysis or certificates of conformance or where exclusion to the scope of certification apply. So all the requirements on the FSCC 22000 logo apply, you know, remain as is. The only difference now is that they've also clarified that you cannot add them on the 
COA or any other documentation where the scope, um, uh, where the exclusion to the scope of certifications apply. Remember, the requirements is that you can market yourself as FSC 22,000, uh, but you should not create an impression that your product, a singular product, is FSSC 22,000 certified on its own and have a, 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 a logo of FSSC on that product. So that's the difference. You can market it, but do not create an impression uh, on a singular product that this e product on its own um, has been approved by FSSC 22,000. So that, that's how they've asked us to clarify that to the people that you train for FSSC. Management of allergens. So that is clause 2.5.6. It's applicable to all food chain categories. Here, you'll see that all the standards seem to be focusing on allergens. It's now becoming a major issue due to the, uh, the supply chain. You know, our food goes to different um, countries and the sensitivity to allergens is different. Some countries like the EU, they've got 14 recognized allergens. And then in the US, they've got nine recognized allergens. Uh, and in South Africa, we have got the big eight and most other South, uh, you know, African countries as well. So you must take that into account. Where is the intended sale of the product that you are manufacturing? That's number one. Number two, what legislation is applicable to wherever is it that you are sending your country? So your product, sorry. So you must keep that in mind. So now let's look at the additional uh, changes that have been introduced in version six. The, you, the organization must establish a documented allergen management plan, and it shall include it, the following. A list of all the allergens handled on site, including in raw materials and finished products. Therefore, you are required to go through the specifications of your raw materials to check if there is any possibility of allergens being present. And also, it must include validation and verification of these control, uh, control measures. And those validation and, and verification systems shall be documented. So there must be proof that indeed you have done it and the documents must be available uh, to that effect. The, um, the procedure must also, or the plan must also include precautionary or warning labels uh, that are being used, but they should only be used where the risk assessment outcome that you have done as a site identify allergen cross-contamination as a risk to the consumer, even though all the necessary control measures have been effectively implemented. So this could bring um, relief to some companies because it clarifies that precautionary or warning labels shall only be used where the risk assessment outcome that you have done identify this, that there is a possibility of allergen cross-contamination as a risk to the consumer. So the final consumer not the customer. So assuming that you are making a product, uh, you know, for a customer that is still going to process it further, it is their responsibility for them to then ensure that the consumer is informed. So that could be in the form of intermediate product in bulk, and then you supply to another person or another company that is still going to further process the product and make it a final product. So that is that person's responsibility to then inform the consumer of the danger that product could pose in terms of allergens. Then for food chain category D, uh, so that is only, only applicable for that uh, food chain category, where there is no allergen related legislation for the country of sale pertaining to animal feed, this section may be indicated as not applicable unless a claim relating to an allergen status has been made on the animal feed. So that is also applicable to us as auditors when we audit your site and we find that uh, this is uh, possibly uh, not something that you could, uh, there is no legislation legislation that you could use as a reference, then in our audit reports, obviously, we would write it as not applicable. So we are going to, I'm going to take just a minute uh, to drink water. In the meantime, I'm just going to play you a video about our new paperless uh, system uh, that we have launched for uh, uh, our various clients. You know, technology, you think you have got it until it disappoints you. So it doesn't seem to want to play. So since um, it is boycotting this webinar, we are then going to proceed.
All right. So let's look at uh, other requirements relating to allergens. There shall be a documented allergen uh, management plan that includes the following application of uh, allergen control measures or undertaking verification system, whatever system that works best for you, depending on the product that you handle, allergen awareness and training on workplace allergens. Remember, awareness is more of an information session and training. It involves some form of competency testing. So there should be that that you put in place uh, as part of the requirements. Remember, workplace allergens, what is relevant to your workplace. So you can do allergen awareness. We have got eight allergens in South Africa or our client in Europe recognizes 14 allergens or our client in the US recognizes nine allergens. But on our site, these are the allergens that we have, and these are the control measures that we have implemented to minimize the risk of the consumer consuming our product that is an allergen unknowingly. So that's the difference between the two. And the allergen management plan shall be reviewed on annual basis or whenever there are changes to key processes that could negatively or that could end up uh, introducing new allergens that you have not taken into account. Here's another section that most sites continue to find very confusing, environmental monitoring. So remember, environmental monitoring in the food industry looks at pathogen spoilage and indicator organisms. So it's not environment per se, uh, but mostly in the, in the, in the microbiological um, sense of, of uh, environmental monitoring. So, and it doesn't also relate to the product per se, but the environment of which you are processing your product or hand your food. So what are the requirements in terms of 2.5.7? So, and this is applicable for food chain categories B3, C, I, and K. The organization shall have in place a risk-based environmental monitoring program. Risk-based already tells you something. For the relevant pathogens, and the key there, for the relevant. You don't list a whole lot of our pathogens and spoilage and indicator organisms only those that are relevant to your site. So it could be the pathogens, spoilage and indicator organisms. And sometimes the mistake that you make as organizations, we only focus on pathogens and we forget about spoilage organisms. So this has been clarified in terms of um, this FSSC version six that you should also consider uh, spoilage and indicator organisms. Remember, the indicator organism could be the E. coli, coliform, enterobacterias here, and sometimes we use total bait count as an indicator. Pathogens, they are harmful, they cause harm. Spoilage, they mainly cause spoilage on the food. For example, it will be yeast, mold, and maybe lactic acid bacteria. So that's what you need to consider when you do that environmental um, risk assessment, which must be risk-based, based on your processes and also based on the nature of the product that you handle. So in terms of the risk, you are expected to define your own risk uh, or formulate your own risk uh, assessment. There also should be a documented uh, procedure for the evaluation of the effectiveness of all controls to prevent contamination from the manufacturing environment. And this shall include at a minimum, the evaluation of microbial, uh, microbiological controls in place, and it shall comply with legal and customer requirements. Unfortunately, in South Africa, you know, we, in terms of microbiological standard, they are all over the place. We have got R692, we have got some that are listed in 638 uh, in terms of the surfaces. So it's all over the place. And you are therefore supposed to then bring everything together and formulate a procedure that will speak to that and see if you are meeting the limits that have been specified in the different uh, category. So that is something that you really should do homework on and also check your customer requirements. And the mistake that we normally make, our customers would write us a product specification. What is it that they would expect from us? The problem is we never really scrutinize the micro sections and look at the limits that they've specified. So make sure that you check for uh, those limits. Organizations such as Sainsbury in Germany, if you're exporting, 
Kellogg's, et cetera, they have got very specific um, requirements. And mo most of us who have been auditing, you know, the, for the last six or seven years, we know exactly what those specifications are. So the moment you say, I'm supplying for Kellogg's, we will know exactly what is it that to be required for you to comply with. So take that into account as you draw your environmental um, um, uh, management risk uh, assessments. Data of the environmental monitoring activities, including regular trend analysis and environmental monitoring program shall be reviewed for the continued effectiveness and suitability at least annually or more often if required, including when the following triggers occur. There are significant changes related to product processes or legislation. For example, in South Africa, we had the listeriosis crisis in 2018, 2017, 2017, 2018. So it necessitated that most organizations review their environmental monitoring program. When also there is no positive testing results that have been obtained over an extended period of time, then you could say that, you know, we haven't found Found anything in terms of these pathogens. So possibly it means that um, in this section of the factory or the facility, based on the processes that we follow, perhaps there is no susceptibility uh, to that specific pathogen, then you'll have to review your system. Trend in and out of specification microbiological results related to both intermediate and finished products linked to environmental monitoring and repeat detection of pathogens during routine environmental monitoring. Here, check, it's pathogen. It doesn't say indicator organism. It doesn't also say um, a spoilage organism. It's very specific, a repeat detection of pathogens during routine environmental monitoring. So those organisms that cause harm, where there are alerts, recalls, or withdrawals related to product or, or, or products produced by the organization, then you are expected to then do a review of your uh, uh, environmental monitoring plan. Okay. All right, thank you, Faith. I got that message. Okay, now let's proceed um, um, to food safety and quality culture. Okay, 2.5.8. Here, we are going to see a lot of problems. I'm telling you this because we the very a very similar requirement has been introduced in BRCGS, and we started auditing it uh, as from February of this year. People are missing a few things here. The standard is very specific. It says that the food safety culture shall include as a minimum communication, training, employee feedback, and engagement. So there is interaction there. Performance measure measurement of defined activities covering all organization sections impacting food safety and quality. So those are key. You must ensure that as you draw your food safety culture plan, you take into account each one of these things, communication, have I addressed it? Training, have I addressed it? Employee feedback and engagement, have I addressed it? Performance measurement of defined activities covering all organization section in pattern food safety and quality, has it been addressed? So the requirement reads as follow, follows in accordance with, and in addition to clause 5.1 of ISO 202018, as part of the organization's commitment, um, commitment to cultivating a positive food safety and quality culture, senior management shall establish and maintain a food safety and quality culture objective as part of the management system. Okay. Food safety and quality culture objective. And is it that addition to that clause 5.1 relating to top management uh, requirements or duties as documented in the standard? In addition to that, there shall be a documented food safety and quality culture plan. It's a plan. Now it's something else as well. There must be a documented food safety and quality culture plan with targets, okay, and timelines. So it's very clear there. There must be a plan. It, has, it should have targets. It shall have timelines that support the objective that you have created in relation to food safety and quality culture. They also must be included in management review and continual uh, improvement process of the organization. Okay, take that into account. Quality control, a new requirement. 
completely new. new. Uh, here, you are supposed to ensure that you have got a quality policy and objective relating to the organization, product or product groups. So normally we'll have a food safety policy. Now we are also supposed to have got to have a quality policy as part of the requirements uh, of the, the organizations in relation to FSSC. So organizations must establish and maintain quality parameters in line with the finished product specifications for all products and product groups. Okay, organization must establish and maintain quality parameters in line with finished product specifications for all products and product groups. So most of us that are supplying um, in the fruit and vegetable sector, we would normally get specifications from retailers that will be very specific as to what are the parameters that we should follow in for our fruits and vegetables that we supply to them. So that is something similar to that. So the organization should on its own accord establish or they could link it to the customer requirements, but the criteria must be in, in a sense that it's not dependent on, you know, uh, let's say a certain retailer, and then on the other retailer, you don't know what to follow. So if you are saying that you're adopting retailer A's requirements, you take those retailer A requirements and you make it consistent uh, throughout the organization. In certain cases, it would happen that there will be an exception because, or a concession that is given because maybe retailer B is not as strict as retailer A. But but you must then specify that in your documentation in terms of when is it that do you deviate from your quality parameters and if you deviate what is the tolerance range that you have stipulated for your own organization analysis and evaluation of the result of the quality control measures and include as uh, part of the management review so that is something that you should also introduce the establishment of quality control procedures uh, that shall also include a program for calibration and verification of equipment used for quality and quality control. So if you have got any equipment, for example, uh, in the citrus industry, they've got sizes, you know, that look at, you know, the size uh, of the fruits, that look at the color of the fruit. So how do you calibrate that equipment and verify that it's still giving you the right readings? Do you do it on annual basis when an, an expert comes to the site or there is somebody who's trained in the facility to do that calibration. So some of us would use a pH and would use titrations. For example, if you are in the dairy industry, we titrate uh, the, the pH uh, to ensure that we, we the pH meter to ensure that we get the correct reading. So that's actually what it's referring to. It could either maybe even a thermometer, whatever the case may be that you are using or the, the skin skills, whatever the case that you're using for quality control. Then you must also introduce line startup and change over procedures. So before I start a new line, what are the things that I'm going to do? What are the steps that I will have to follow for that line to start? And if I have then, uh, you know, manufactured product A, batch one, okay, and then it ends at 11, how do I change over to batch two? Okay, what are the change over procedures that I follow? Do I check whether the product is lying on the line? Do I check for the labels and make sure that they are cleared on the lines? Do I check for any packaging material? Do I check for the equipment that is being used that it shouldn't be used for this particular product? So the change over procedures are defined by your organizations, but the minimum requirement is that you cannot use the same label if it's a different la uh, label that you are using. So you must ensure that it's cleared out of any uh, labels or packaging if it's not a similar product. Remember the, the minutes that we are changing, it means that there is something that is different between batch one and batch two. So you must define that in accordance to your organization's uh, processes. Then let's look at transport, storage, and warehousing. Um, what are the changes that have been introduced there? And remember, this is also applicable to all food chain categories. So for food chain category C0, 
the organization shall have specified requirements in place that define post slaughter time and temperature in relating to the chilling or freezing of the products. Then for food chain category F1, in addition to clause 9.3 that deals um, um, uh, the management review, the organization shall ensure that the product is transported and delivered under conditions which minimize the potential for food uh, contamination. So excuse me there, it relates to clause 9.3 of the technical specification, not of the tech of the ISO 22000 standard. Okay, so that's my mistake there. Where transport tankers are used, the following shall apply in addition to clause 8.2.4 of ISO 22000. So here we would use that when we are transporting dairy products. Uh, so bulk milk tanks, for example, this will be applicable to them because they transport uh, milk to possibly the dairies. Uh, so that will then be applicable to you. So this is what is required. There shall be a risk assessment for transport tankers and supply agreements that should be in place between the organization and the service provider. So if you have outsourced, uh, outsourced that service to a service provider, make sure that there is a risk assessment and also supply agreements that we have put in place uh, between yourself and the uh, service provider that is providing you with that service. The um, also, in addition to the risk assessment and the SLA, you must also include tanker cleaning validation, how to ensure that the tankers are clean, and also restric restrictions linked to prior use and applicable control measures rela relevant to the transport uh, transported product for organizations receiving the raw materials in tankers. So you could say that you, you don't allow a multi-load where they uh, load different products, you don't allow allow mixing it to with another uh, product, uh, for example, from another uh, camp organization. So you could stipulate what are the limitations that you as an organization expect and ensure that that is included as part of the supplier agreement that you have with that supplier. And also cleaning validation. Remember, it, it, cleaning validation means how do you prove that that tanker is thoroughly cleaned? Uh, so if you have got a CIP system, we know that we, we use titrations to check for any uh, caustic or acidity that is present. We also use rinse water for any microbiological um, uh, organisms that could be present. So look at it from that perspective, okay? Let's look at this clause, uh, clause 2.5.11 which relates to hazard control and measures preventing cross-contamination. Again, this is applicable to all food chain categories, excluding F2. So let's look at what is it that they will expect you as a site to introduce. For food chain category D, the organization shall have uh, uh, in place procedures to manage the use of ingredients or additive that contain components that can have an adverse animal impact or health impact. So for all food chain categories, excluding F2, the following requirements relating to foreign matter management apply in addition to clause 8.2.4 of ISO 2018. They should be, number one, a documented risk assessment in place to determine the need and type of foreign body detection equipment required, okay? When the organization deems no foreign body detection equipment is necessary, you must justify why you don't need it, and that must be documented. So there is, for those of you who are wondering, what is it that I'm supposed to do here? I, I would advise you to use the um, BRCGS. I'll show you later the example of those who are not familiar with BRCGS in terms of what risk assessment that you could introduce into your facility. So it's already done. You can just include it as part of your procedures and say, okay, we don't have a metal detector. We don't have an X-ray or any form of uh, detection, but then this is a justification that we have in order for us not to introduce that. So I'll show you that template um, later on as we go through um, this presentation. Then a documented procedure shall be in place to manage and use the equipment selected. Again, this change is not a small change. So it's, it requires a lot of things that, uh, you know, in other GFSI recognized standards they've already done. And in most cases, people think, you know, I can just write a small equipment procedure to address this. These are completely different things. And I'll show you shortly why do I say that. 
Another requirement, controls and procedures for managing all breakages linked to potential physical contamination. That could include the metals, it could include uh, glasses, it could include hard plastics, uh, ceramics, whatever that you could have in your organization could, that could break. You must ensure that you have got a, 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 a procedure in place. Product design and development, clause 2.5.13, also very new. Okay, hey, what are the requirements then? This is applicable for food chain categories B3. Uh, it's also uh, applicable to uh, uh, C, D, E, F, I, and K. So you must have a procedure to include a process of ongoing shelf life verification in place at a frequency based on risk. So that is uh, most case, in most cases, what we do as organization will use retention samples. But in this case, what you need to remember is, uh, and this is a mistake that you make, you'd find that your shelf life, you say that you make a claim that the product will last three months, but your shelf life study or retention sample, you only keep it for a month. That won't meet this requirement. If you say that the shelf life of the product is three months, the expectation would be that you would, uh, on a continuous basis, test a once in a while your product to see if it can last for the full three months that you have claimed on your packaging material, on your uh, product packaging, on your label, whatever the case may be. So this is what it, it, it means. So other organization, because of the lack of space and the amount of resources required to do chef life study, they would say that uh, we will only test um, one every of every 10 batches or uh, two batches in a month. That's the one that will take through uh, the chef life study. The standard allows you to do that because the risk or the frequency must be based on risk that you as an organization have formulated. That is what essentially it means. Where a ready-to-cook product is produced, the cooking instructions provided on the product label or packaging shall be validated to ensure food safety is maintained. So if you have said to the consumer, this is how long it should take, uh, you know, 80 degrees for uh, 50 minutes, then you must prove that indeed, uh, if you if the consumer were to follow it, follow that for the ready to cook product is is it does it minimize the risk of contamination? Does it eliminate any uh, pathogens that could be present in that product and ensure that that is uh, uh, filed in your filing system? Then 2.5.15 looks at equipment management here. Uh, there are a lot of problems. Again, this is a clause that has been introduced uh, in PRCGS uh, issue um, nine that has been audited since this year. Many problems that we are finding here. So you must ensure that you read this with understanding. The first thing is documented purchase specification in place. This does not mean that your uh, the supplier of equipment must give you uh, a specification of the product, no. What is it that you as an organization would uh, follow or check for when you procure a new product? That's what it essentially means. And that purchase specification must address the hygienic design, applicable legal and customer requirements, and the equipment intended use. What is this going to be used for? And this is done prior to you buying or procuring that particular uh, equipment. It's something that you'll do as an organization. The supplier shall have, uh, shall provide evidence of meeting the purchase specification before installing. So it, it, you see now, um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's like it comes uh, from um, your organization and you give it to the supplier. This is what we have done. Do, do, do you meet these requirements as a supplier? So it essentially means something similar to that. Okay, I've got a question here. For documented risk assessment of for, on foreign object detection, does it have to be a separate document from the organization's hazard analysis? I will show you now why it's a separate document. It is, it's a separate document. So it looks at the overall um, risk not necessarily the process step. Because remember, in terms of the hazard analysis, we're looking at specific process steps. So it looks at the overall picture. So it's now the final product. And then you say, now we've got a final product. Why do we not need a, 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 a risk asset? I'm, I'm actually tempted to show you now. Uh, Okay, maybe let me let me not get too excited. So when I once I receive good questions, I want to show exactly 
what is it um, that I am trying to explain here? Okay, I'll show you now. Let me not uh, deviate. Okay, I'll show you. Okay, so all these things that I see, I'm saying that I'll show you examples. Please remind me at the end of the presentation, I would I'll show you those examples. Okay. You must also establish a risk based change management uh, process for new equipment or any changes to existing equipment, which shall be adequately documented, including evidence of success, uh, successful co commissioning. That is also a key requirement uh, that uh, most of the organization confuse. Um, and um, now I think I can show you this. I have a document open here in terms of the equipment management. So I'll show you examples. What exactly is it that we mean here? All right. All right. So for those of you who may want, I'll send this document, but for a comprehensive uh, documentation system, if you go on our website, we have got FSSC 22,000 toolkits that you can buy and implement for your own organization. So you can see that there is templates and then you can just click on the template, see the price. If you can afford it, you can buy it or you can buy it at a later stage. But in terms of a uh, purchase specification, this is what is it that uh, you could uh, possibly formulate for your own organization so you've got a product code, you can formulate equipment name, what is it, the description, the intended use, and what type of material it will, uh, uh, it will handle, why the equipment was procured, who is a supplier, is it secondhand or new, relevant legislation. Remember, these things are taken directly from the uh, requirements. We have read each of those requirements and ensure that that is included as part of this uh, uh, document. Equipment parts, details, description of component, contact with food. If it does, does it um, then uh, you know, comply with the requirements? And then we have uh, you know, included uh, some sort of guidance there. Then equipment cross-contamination assessment, that will be procurement. Um, risk assessment, are the specification for use available? Yes or no. Uh, requirements for calibration, yes or no. You comment, you go on and on and on. And then we look at the HESAP, um, the, the recommendation from the HESAP team uh, before you procure, and then the anticipated date of arrival. And after that, we are looking at installation. And then what are the requirements uh, there? We are looking at the inspection, the integrity of the equipment uh, is maintained during uh, installation. You know, there are no loose uh, nuts or bolts that are falling all over as you install location of equipment. Then post-installation, we look at everything that you need to do post-installation, including introducing it into your new system. We are looking at in, uh, training of the people that would need to use the equipment, microbiological or allergen physical contamination that could be in introduced. So you look at all those risks. Is there any chemical risk? Is there any microbiological uh, risk? Is there any allergen? Is there any physical contamination that could be introduced as a result of the installation process? And then hygiene clearance done uh, post-installation. You do that. Um, has, have you updated your hazard analysis or risk assessment? And so on and so forth. So this you will do for any new equipment that you will be installing. So that is equipment purchase specification. Okay. Let me show you another example that relates to um, commissioning. Okay. You see. All right. So this is another template that you could introduce where, um, uh, remember, it made reference to commissioning checklist and risk assessment. So again, you follow the same thing um, where you do a very specific risk assessment for that equipment. So the nice thing about this is sometimes you can modify it so that uh, you, know, you don't have to use uh, for each equipment. You can use it uh, for all equipment. Instead of it being just for the equipment to be installed, it could be, you could write it here for each one of them and do the risk assessment for each. So this is what we, the other organizations more or less for the other standards are, are implementing. So, but of course, this is our own document, uh, but it, it caters for all the requirements that are specified here. So I want you to be more or, or less alert that although 
the change seems fairly small. It's just one sentence, but the interpretation interpretation thereof, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's quite a comprehensive requirement that you need to ensure that you introduce uh, for your own organization in order to comply for this. It could be, um, and Nandipa asked Haim Togozis, can, can this be included in the planning of changes? It could be as long as, um, you know, it, it incorporates all the key requirements that have been specified, because normally when we do the planning of changes, it's normally a, a generic um, a document that looks into uh, you know the type of changes that could be introduced it doesn't necessarily speak to maintenance and equipment so you know because as an auditor you will show me show me the planning of changes but what evidence is it that when you have sourced this equipment you have pages this is the, the checklist that is required by the standard has been completed so i think the tricky thing will be that you know the evidence of complying with each of these uh, nuances these nitty gritties that have been specified by the standard uh instead of the you know a generic document that looks at um whatever changes the organization could go through so i think that will be a bit of a challenge unless in your planning for changes there is a, 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 an additional checklist that you have formulated for each of the changes that could potentially occur. And in terms of that additional checklist, you sort of are able to cater for the, those requirements, you know. So, for example, planning for changes for um, uh, leadership change or HESAP team, then you have got a, a, an additional checklist that if it does happen, this is what you'll do. If you have got something like that, then you could do it. Okay, great. Uh, that will be fine then, Nandi. I think it will it will address then the requirement as long as that there is that additional checklist to cover the requirements. Excellent. That will be a good idea. Okay. So now let's proceed with our presentation. I've shown you the example. Now let's look at um, the next requirement. Food loss and waste. So this is mainly a policy. Uh, that you'll introduce as a facility. So you must have a documented policy and objective detailing the organization's strategy to reduce food loss and waste within the organization and the related supply chain. So we want to reduce food waste. You're right there. This is how we'll do it. What is our objective? We want to reduce it by 3% in the next three years. You have met the requirement. You must have controls in place to manage products and donate it to not-for-profit organizations, employees, and other organizations, and ensure that these products are safe to consume. Some people are interpreting this as discouraging, um, you know, people from, well, you know, companies from handing food to not-for-profit. That is completely not the intention of it. It is encouraged to say, instead of throwing away food, give it to people who need it. That's the purpose. That's the entire framework of this requirement. It doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't be donating food to not-for-profit organizations, employees, and other organizations. It is meant to address exactly that, that instead of throwing away food, rather hand it to people who can find use to it. The requirement for you as an organization is to ensure that it is safe, and then we have got some traceability information that you keep. Uh, for that particular food that you have donated to Charity A, for example, you write, I donated uh, 50 uh, kg of um, um, fruits to this company, and this is the batch number of that particular product, product, and we confirm that it is a safe product. That's all what is required. Manage surplus, uh, surplus products or byproducts intended as animal feed or food to prevent contamination of these products. These processes shall comply with the applicable legislation if the country does have, be kept up to date and not have any negative impact on food safety. So while you're donating food, ensure that that food is not unsafe uh, for the people that you're donating to. And it must also, you could link it to your objective that uh, from uh, year two, we are going to start instead of, uh, you know, losing food or wasting, donating to charities. And we aim to donate at least 50% of what we would categorize normally as waste. So, for example, you'll have class three fruits uh, 
or product that I have got uh, damaged uh, um, packaging or there is something wrong, but the, the safety of the product is not affected. So instead of throwing away that, you could say that we are going to start slowly and uh, as time goes, donating those products to charities, and that would also reduce the loss of food that we are losing as an organization. And of course, you are not going to categorize it as waste. We are going to categorize it as food that you have given to charities. So basically, it's more or less supposed to uh, address um, um, uh, the, the food loss or food waste in that manner. Communication requirements that have been introduced for all GFSI recognized certifications within three working days, the organization shall communicate with the certification body any situations where the integrity of certification and or the foundation can be brought into disrepute. This includes but are not limited to. So read this requirement very carefully. Previously, we would think it relates to product recall, you know, food recall, it's not. It's very comprehensive. Serious events that impact the food safety management system, legality and integrity of certification, or situations that threaten food safety or certification due to force majeure, natural or man-made disasters. And in South Africa, we have had quite, you know, look at transnet, looking at the, the Durban riots in July 2021. So that is part and parcel of this. Public food safety events, that will be your product public recalls, withdrawals, food safety outbreaks, calamities that uh, come as a result of uh, food safety, actions imposed by regulatory authorities as a result of a food safety issue. So assuming that you are a, an exporter, uh, NRCS, if you're in the fishing industry, the National Regulator of Compulsory Specification impose, suspends your license for whatever reason you are supposed to inform the certification body. PBECB raises a major issue about your product. You are supposed to inform your certification body. So any regulatory authority, including the assignees that have been assigned by the Department of Agriculture. So they are more or less under the regulations, regulatory authorities in that sense. So if there is any situation of that sort, then make sure that you inform your certification body and certification body have, bodies have been told that if an auditor goes on site and they find that they have not been informed of a major incident, then the certification of that organization can be suspended. So that's how serious it is. Another um, addition, legal proceedings, uh, prosecutions, malpractice and negligence. Also make sure that you inform your certification body of that. The last um, requirement relates to organization that have uh, multi-sites. Uh, what are the requirements that pertain to them? Let's go through them. Um, their management of the central function shall ensure that sufficient resources are available and that roles, responsibilities, and requirements are clearly defined for management, internal auditors, technical personnel, reviewing internal audits, and other key personnel involved in the food safety management system. So that those are the requirements for organization with multi-site certification and specifically for categories uh, E, F, and G. So for those food chain categories. And then internal audit requirements, what is it that organization should comply with? In addition to clause 9.2 of ISO 22000 relating to internal audits, the organization shall adhere to the following requirements relating to internal audits. The central function shall establish the internal audit procedure and program that will be followed by the other sites. The internal auditors shall be independent of the areas they audit and be assigned by the central function to ensure impartiality of at the site level. So the head office would assign uh, auditor A, auditor B, and say this is how then you'll audit. And also the management system, central function, and all such shall be audited at least annually or more frequently based on risk assessment. So the risk assessment, you can formulate based on the number of findings that the site has attained in the previous year, based on the risk of the product, you will have to define what risk assessment criteria you are going to follow. And the effectiveness of corrective action uh, shall be demonstrated. We are nearing the end. 
Internet auditors shall meet at least the following requirements, and this is very much stipulated, and this shall be assessed by the central, uh, by the certification body annually. This is because in multi-site, the uh, auditors are not going to audit all sites. They will select, all right, and then they'll rely on the authenticity or the audit reports that are produced by the internal auditors to ensure that, um, you know, the site has been audited thoroughly. So they must have work experience, which will be two years of full time uh, in the food industry, including at least one year within the organization. And the certification body auditors have been, you know, in, you know, they are supposed to uh, check for that. The education, they must have completed a higher education course, or if you don't have a, a formal course, have at least five years of work experience in food production or manufacturing, transport storage, retailing, inspection, or enforcement. Okay, now the first audit to version six will commence from 1 April 2024 onwards, and we are going to see a lot of fires there. I anticipate, um, you know, that most organizations would wake up and say, now we have got certification, and they are start, they will start upgrading their system. My advice is start now while it's still new, and by the time April 2024 comes, uh, you know, you are ready for these audits. Remember that also uh, for those of you who go, who are certified, they, these unannounced audits and all those kind of things. So just take that into account. And all organization must complete the version six upgrade audit before the 31st of March, 2025. So the audits start on the 1st of April, 2024, and everyone else must have migrated to version six by the end of March, 2025. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for paying attention. And for those of you who have asked questions, uh, I think I do owe somebody a, a, a foreign, um, you know, a body detection risk assessment. I just want to make sure that I show you that uh, before uh, I end off this uh, presentation. But if you have got questions, this is your opportunity to ask um, for, you know, those questions. If you've got any comments, I am more than happy to attend to that. So this is your opportunity now to talk. I've been talking, um, you know, continuously for the last um, hour and a half. Okay, I'm just getting ready to show you um, this um, foreign body risk assessment. Okay, I'm ready to show you. Okay, so this is a, a, a risk assessment. Uh, if you look at it, I think somebody asked that. Um, um, I'm just looking at the chats. Maria, okay, ask that question. Okay, so this is a foreign body detection equipment, okay? Um, risk, so it's under the uh, uh, procedure, foreign, it's a foreign material procedure. So I've written here foreign material procedure, everything else, and then the risk assessment is here. Does a customer conduct specify that metal detection is required? Yes, you then require it. Does a product pass through a foreign body removal process and capable of detecting or removing material smaller, smaller than the, that can be detected by metal de de detector? You say this. Um, and then if it's a no, are there robust effective systems of product inspection or controls of likely sources of metals? Then if there's a no, metal detector is required. If there is knife controls, hard plastic, you know, you've got knife controls, blade register, um, inspection of foreign uh, body equipment, scissor register, then it will be a yes. Is a product or nature or user such that any metal contamination would immediately and always be apparent to the customer and will consequently be removed before usage of the product. It's a no, metal detection required. And if, if it is a yes, metal detector, detection not compulsory. And then the questions here, this is what you would follow. Um, so this is just an example of a risk assessment that you could use or implement for your facility. You could choose to use any other system. It's entirely up to you. But this, I think, would be easier uh, for, um, for an organization to uh, implement. Um, to, so because you, most of you us will stop here. Uh, you know, um, you'll say yes, and then we will try to make sure that we answer it in such a sense that it doesn't really 
um, require us to install a meta detector because of course it is very, very, very um, uh, expensive to do so. You, um, uh, uh, Shante, you just need to, if we outsource manufacturing, can validation or verification of allergy management just be sent to, just be sent to the final product for testing or we have to actually organize swaps to be done at manufacturing sites? Um, it, it will depend, um, you know, it will depend on the frequency of verification, for example, and also the type of verification that you implement, but the best will be um, to do at the manufacturing site, but if you uh, then send it for testing, the question would be, do you make sure that you receive the, result, the results first before you send out the product. What happens if you have sent it for testing and you have already sold your product? So you just need to clarify that. And if, but if the system is in such a sense that you can ease the spot and you know that particular contaminant in the product before it reaches the market or before you send it out, then you could use that uh, as a form of uh, verification. Uh, validation in most cases we'll have to send to the lab because we do it once you know we do a proper validation study we then file that and then we verify against that so you don't have to do it repeatedly you know so validation definitely that i don't have an issue the issue is verification and its reliability for me um, when we are verifying as a site um, is it live is it in such a sense that you can easily pick up any form of contamination before the product leaves the facility so that's where i will have an issue okay let's see if there's another question Excellent, thank you. All right, so ladies and gents, thank you so much for attending the webinar. So what will happen now, we will send you the recording um, and those of you who ask specific questions, um, then there are some documents that we can share from our toolkit uh, in, in relation to this webinar only for you. Uh, and then yes, if you have got any other question that has not been clarified, you are more than welcome to email me and I'll help me, uh, you know, answer whatever questions that you may have. Um, so I'm going to just type my email address here. Okay. So for those of you who logged in late um, and didn't get my name, so when you email me, um, that is what you'll see. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.